Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone for the 17th of August 2014. Richard Saunders here with you from a very chilly Calder Park Raceway near Melbourne. I've come down here to do some in-car video work, which I do from time to time, and DVD production. And uh, I'm uh, just sort of between my duties at the moment. I'm up here in the control room, which is heated, I'm delighted to say, looking down on the race track. There goes car 14, screaming past. But it is mighty cold here at Calder Park, well-named park. But you don't want to know about that. You want to know what's coming up on the Skeptic Zone this week. We're going to kick off with Dr. Rachie reports, the welcome return of Dr. Rachie. She, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, was at Skeptics in the Pub in Sydney. Where, oh, there goes number six. Wow, that's tearing on. Where she addressed the crowd, told them all about the success of the Facebook group Stop the AVN. Stop the Australian Vaccination Network. What an interesting talk it is, and what a fine lesson in sceptical activism, which really, really has results. I urge you to listen carefully. Dr. Rachie reports coming up at the top of the show. Okay, what's happening now? Car number eight's coming in. Passenger gets out. It's a... Uh, oh, wow, car number nine screaming down the straight... It's a day where people get to come in and race real racing cars. Well, should I say they get to drive in them with an instructor to get a feeling what it's like to be in a real racing car, and then they do hot laps with an uh, an instructor driving, which is very thrilling indeed. Hmm. Well, after Dr. Reggie reports, we have a week in science from the Royal Institution of Australia in the beautiful city of Adelaide. Um, and good on them. Wow, they keep churning out a week in science. Well done, Paul Willis and team. Well done indeed. And uh, judging by the letters I receive, a lot of people do enjoy that segment. Here comes car number 55 to change passengers. Then we have a report about an article which appeared in the Sunshine Coast Daily newspaper up in Queensland, which tried to give balance to pro and anti immunization but failed spectacularly. And you'll know why when we have the original article read out. Then we'll read out um, a typical reply sent by the editor of the magazine when skeptics voiced their uh, concern. And finally, we're going to have the open letter written by uh, Ross Balch from uh, Brisbane that was published. I think published at least online, maybe in print itself. Another good example of sceptical Activism. So I uh, urge you to especially listen to the open letter at the end of the show. Now, before we get stuck into the show, a couple of little uh, messages and information. Don't forget to visit maynard.com.au, our reporter Maynard's own website. He has his own podcast called Bunga Bunga, which is a lot of fun. Bunga Bunga. Check it out at maynard.com.au. And he does that with Tim Ferguson, who is one of the members of the Doug Anthony All-Stars. Australians will know who I am talking about. And also in the last week, I was on a podcast, um, Skeptically Challenged. So if you Google Skeptically Challenged podcast, it's uh, me having a, a talk about all the things I've been doing. Um, so the tables are turned. And this time I get interviewed. And I talk about the Vaccination Chronicles video and uh, the Australian skeptics and... Um, what it was like to be on TV a couple of years back, and all sorts of things. So you might find that interesting. As now, what's this car coming down the straight now? Here it comes. Screaming along, it's car number 55. There it goes. Followed closely by car number 14. Well, that's enough nail-biting excitement from uh, for me up here in the control booth of the Calder Park Raceway. I'm going to venture outside, try to at least, it's pretty cold outside. I'm going to go down to the little canteen there, maybe have a a chip or two. Maybe I should have an apple. Hmm. While I'm doing that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. No. 
Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Um, okay, so tonight we have uh, Dr. Rachel Dunlop. We'll be talking about the SAVN, which actually should now be the SAVSN, right? Savison. But we haven't, we, we, we really don't bother going that far. Hyphenated. But uh, I th- we wonder how much time they will have to actually get their SAV, AVSN established. Rachel is a constant campaigner, a member of a- uh, Stop the AVN, and uh, I think she'll be talking about that this evening. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Tim. I was, wanted to talk to you tonight about some research that Stop the Australian Vaccination Network recently presented at an immunisation conference. And I think this is quite unique in the sense that if you know anything about SAVN, you'll know that we primarily are a Facebook page. We're primarily a bunch of diligent rat bags, if you like. So we're just a rough so- sort of gathering of people that came together in 2009. Um, in fact, the group was formed by Daniel Raffaele. Um, and since then, we've grown to about 12,000 members. But essentially, we're not an organised group, really. Our focus is Facebook, so that's kind of our official presence. But we do have uh, a different levels of expertise across the group, and some of that includes scientists, medical professionals, also lay people. Um, and we decided, after some, some questions from people uh, in the immunisation research field that wanted to know, well, okay, you guys have been going since 2009, but what evidence do you have that you're having any impact on the AVN? You need to do some analysis. And we thought, well, you know what, that's actually a good point. And we do have scientists and medical doctors and statisticians and epidemiologists in our midst. So we thought it's about time we got off our proverbials and actually did something that we could present to um, the scientific community. And so that resulted in this long title, which is a poster that was presented by Tracy McDermott as the first author. Tracy is an undergraduate student. Um, she just began studying nursing, and was it nursing or public health? She's, yeah, she's a first-year public health undergraduate student. So this poster was presented at the uh, 14th Annual Public Health Association of Australia National Immunisation Conference. So this is a prestigious, well-respected conference in Melbourne. And for Tracy to get the opportunity to go there and present this data was, um, we think, pretty cool. So I'm the last author, which means I basically just called the shots when people did stuff I didn't like. But this is a collective effort. Tracy is the first author, so all complaints would go to her, please. Um, Of course, Anne was involved. Um, There are other people that were involved in putting this work together whose names are not here, but we're all volunteers. We all did this in our spare time. And I'm just going to go through some of the results that we got. And I think it's pretty cool that we were able to get this together and present it at a scientific conference because this now represents a publication for us. So the impetus, I guess, for this was that, um, as I mentioned, we've been going since 2009, but throughout this time we'd observed that we thought the media had kind of changed the way it was treating the Australian Vaccination Network. And I like to use this slide as an example of how Um, the ex-president used to be referred to by the media. This was from a talk that was in fact in 2010, I think, where she was referred to as Australia's leading expert in vaccination. Now, this was one of the issues that we we took with the way the media treated this group because this person doesn't have any qualifications, this person doesn't have any experience in medicine, this person doesn't have any statistics experience or any qualifications in fact she just she finished high school but didn't finish anything at university so when we came to look at well has the media's treatment or perception of the way they um, now refer to this group this was sort of our our beginning to see how things have gone since then so these are some of a selection of some of the news clips that I just found today from googling that have occurred in the mainstream media in the last well, five years since we since Stop Avian has been around. So where you used to have Australia's leading expert in vaccination, you now get headlines in the Murdoch press that say things like anti-vaccine zealots, anti-vaccine groups, charity, status opposed in Fairfax, health experts call for ban on anti-vaccine campaigner, 
And I bring to your attention the use of the term anti-vaccine. This is something that we wanted to measure in our research because previously, our and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is the way science works usually is people make an observation and then they go forward and test it. So our observation was that the media had stopped calling these people um, vaccine watchdogs or um, parents groups who were lobbying for safety of vaccines. They've now started calling them what they are, anti-vaccine campaigners. So we started to see all these things across the mainstream media. We're able to actually measure this, and I'll show you the results for that in a minute. But some of the other things that happened is we didn't have to do all this work. The Murdoch press actually helped us a little bit, which I never thought I'd say, really. Um, Some of you may remember the Telegraph campaign called No Jab, No Play. And this was actually spearheaded by a journalist by the name of Jane Hansen, And this ran over several weeks where the Telegraph was campaigning to increase vaccination rates in New South Wales and also to discredit the anti-vaccination movement. And in fact, this campaign has now spread to Queensland and they're they're doing some of this stuff in Queensland. So I wanted to start with this slide because um, this was the response that we got from the Australian Vaccination Network once they found out we'd presented this poster. Um, And I wanted to highlight a couple of terms that they use because throughout the course of our work, they keep claiming that they want respect and everyone deserves respect, everyone deserves freedom of speech and we should respect them. So, in fact, it took them quite a few days, I think, and to find out we'd been at the conference. (laughs) So we were sort of waiting with bated breath to see what their response would be. But they referred to us as anti-competitive, illegal behaviour, SAVN and their leaders are deluded, hateful and discriminatory people. Now, keep in mind that this was scientific data presented at a scientific conference. This was not some sort of um, fright bat column written in an opinion piece. This was data we, we put together as scientists. They then called us religious fanatics whose god is pseudoscience and whose mantra is, whoever disagrees with us should be subject to our inquisition. Um, it goes on about how we are too stupid or something. And, but I particularly like this, um, this last line about your members believe in pseudoscience and you have an amazing ability to ignore any and all scientific research that doesn't fit in with your own views on the subject. I think that we need to highlight this, don't you? To me it sounds a little bit hippo- pot kettle. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe they're just projecting. Projecting in high high definition, perhaps. So to go through some of the data that we put together um, for this poster, um, so as I said, the group was established by Daniel Raffaele on Facebook in 2009. There's now more than 12,000 people that like the page, which doesn't necessarily mean they're members or anything. Nobody pays a fee. We don't collect funds. We don't collect money. We're not a charity. But we're just a bunch of people that like the page and follow the the procedures or the the process of what's happening. And I guess we use the novel technique of combating um, anti-vaccine misinformation primarily through social media. So there's a lot of us that have very high presence on Twitter as well, and there's a number of very diligent um, admins that look after the Facebook page, and Anne is usually the night shift. I tend to do the evening shift, and then we have the guys during the day. (laughs) So basically one of the aims of our group is to, um, to seek to inhibit the reach and influence of the AVN. And this is because not only because they actually profit in terms of money from perpetuating their misinformation, but they're obviously doing harm. Now anyone that opens the papers these days, um, even uh, Eve here from um, Quebec, would see that whooping cough is making a resurgence. There's measles outbreaks all over the world now. And a lot of this is being attributed to people not getting vaccinated. Um, In particular with the measles outbreaks, we're looking now squarely down at Andrew Wakefield for the scaremongering he um, is responsible for in 1998. So this sort of stuff is not just um, science denial that annoys me because I'm a scientist. It has um, a tangible effect and often that results in kids getting sick and nobody wants that. So we do this by several... Well, actually, we have a lot of fingers in a lot of pies. But everything is legal and above board. I should say that because we were accused of doing illegal things in a slide before. 
We do things like submit complaints to government bodies. So, for example, the AVN used to have a charity licence. We submitted complaints to that body that looked after those. It was taken away. We also, and I think this is particularly important and I'm particularly proud of us for this, is we offer ourselves as alternatives to the mainstream media. Journalists tend to have this practice where they'll do a balanced story. So they'll get somebody who is a doctor who's studied to be a paediatrician for 20 years, who works in infectious disease with children who get sick, and then they'll say, well, hang on, we need someone who has some reckons. So they'll just Google someone and find some person who reckons vaccines might be toxic, And they'll put these two people on the same TV program and then say, what do you reckon? Now, that's normally okay because normally people's opinions are opinions and that's fine. And, you know, you can say, do you like blue or do you not like blue? And let's argue that until the cows come home. No problem. But when it comes to um, stories or um, information that involves science and medicine, this can be particularly specious because it can result in people making the wrong decision based on false information. And this is called false balance. So for many, many years, the media would go to the AVN and say, okay, what do you guys reckon? And they would sit them on stage next to a paediatrician and they'd do their reckons. So now we make an effort to offer ourselves up as experts or at least having some form of expertise so that we're there instead. So that's what I mean by a considerable effort is placed on encouraging media outlets to stop doing false balance. So the boring bits of of how we went about this analysis is our methods and it's it's pretty simple and we have a lot more work to do. But I think what we found was quite impressive. This was done by um, one of our authors that you saw at the beginning. So we looked through the print media for the last five years using a database called Factiva which allows you to mine all incidences of mentions of a certain um, name of of either the AVN or... Um, the name of the ex-president. And then what we did was we classified these uh, results according to two things. Negative, so was the press reporting in a negative fashion? Were they calling them anti-vaccine, for example? Or positive, were they referring to them as vaccine watchdogs or a a non-profit parent group or something that didn't make them sound bad? And we also looked at their finances, Because obviously one of the reasons that these people are able to gain access to parents and access to uh, people that want information about vaccines is if they've got enough money. And back in 2010, this group used to do a lot of tours where they'd go out, they'd cross the whole country, in fact, and give seminars all over the place, from Perth to Griffith to Queensland, talking to parents, and that requires money. So we wanted to know if our campaign to discredit them had impacted on their finances. And yes, it did, quite significantly, actually. Um, this is a little dollop of science called a graph. It's very sciencey, But basically, what you can see is this red line here is indicating when SAVN was formed. And you can see here we've got the income that they made over time. You can see that it plateaued and then fell in 2009 and beyond. Their expenses followed that line as well, which means their profit is going down. Donations that they received, because they rely on a lot of donations from the public, they went up initially because they did, they did ask for a lot of help when they initially started receiving criticism from us, but then they fell almost down to zero by 2012. Now, you probably can't see this line here, but it's pale blue and it follows the x-axis here perfectly. Can anyone read what that says? It says donations by the AVN. From 1998 to 2012, totals, from what we calculated, $480. Now, these people were a charity in New South Wales. They were collecting money for charitable purposes, allegedly. But we can only find evidence in their financial records of donating $480. And just in case you don't know, if you are a registered charity, your finances are available online to anybody. So we didn't do anything illegal to access them. Anyone can access a charity's financial records. But on top of that, if you do, if you add all these up and subtract everything, you find there's about $100,000 missing as well. Don't know what happened to that. 
But the point is that financially we've had quite a big impact on their ability to operate. So in summary, it shows that since the formation of SAVN, there's been a decrease of 50% in income to this charity, or well, they're not a charity anymore, and a 70% decrease in the number of donations that they've received. So this is clearly going to impact their bottom line and their ability to get out and disseminate misinformation. So the next thing we looked at was how the media has, been, has, has dealt with the AVN since we've been trying to educate them about their true agenda. And I should say that their name has since changed. Their acronym is still the AVN, but they were known as the Australian Vaccination Network for a very long time, until quite recently, in fact. This year, I think they had to change their name. But the Australian Vaccination Network, it sounds like quite an innocuous name, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like it's anti-anything. So this, in my opinion, is deliberate because they don't want to stand up and say we're the anti-vaccination network because then how are they going to coax parents into listening to them? So they've since had to change their name to Australian Vaccine Skeptics Network. I'll let you argue whether the skeptics is possibly a little bit misguided. But they still use the acronym AVN. In any case, what we did here was we tracked the number of mentions in the media and we ranked them according to positive or negative. Negatives appear in red and positives appear in blue. This is the line where SAVN was formed and you can see there's this massive increase in red. Those who are astute amongst you will also notice that there's an increase in the number of mentions overall. These increasing proportion though was increasingly negative. So we went from 67% of these mentions were negative versus 33% over the five years since SAVN was formed. And this was compared to 82% were positive before we started working on this project. So in summary, affecting their bottom line in terms of their finances and affecting um, the media's impression and the way that the media treats them has multiple effects. It's imp certainly impeded on their reputation. They're now probably the only place they'll get treated well and positively and um, as if they're doing a good job is, th is on conspiracy podcasts and on conspiracy websites. The mainstream media, except for very occasionally, refers to them almost 100% as anti-vaccine. They no longer refer to them as a, a nice parent group who's just trying to look after vaccines. So this has been this shift in media perception that we've tracked here has been compounded by several other projects that we've done on the side. And these have been initiated by SAVN and they involve government sanctions. And these include things like them losing their charity licence. Uh, this includes them having a public warning issued by the Healthcare Complaints Commission. This includes them having to change their name to the Australian Vaccine Skeptic Network to better indicate their true agenda. And I, I think this is really important, is that we've offered ourselves as experts where appropriate to the media in place of them. So instead of just taking them away from the media and saying, oh, they're bad, we've said, look, here's a better option, talk to us. So these are very preliminary results, and we're hoping to do more analysis, and we're hoping to publish this as a paper, um, if we can, in the future. But we're very proud to have presented it at a scientific peer-reviewed conference. And we think that overall, um, it's resulted in, their, in reducing their ability to, to spread misinformation. And in a period of where the internet is so important in people's health decisions, where people search for um, diagnoses online and the AVN comes up as the number one hit on Google, we need to make people aware that what they say is not accurate and is not based on science. So if you got this month's sceptic, which is the one Tim showed earlier, there is a letter in there from Ken McLeod, who is sort of the grandpa of SAVN. And he lists some of the things that we have achieved since 2009. He goes into more detail than what I have today. But he, now, he mentions that the AVN and, and the ex-president's fame is now infamous and its fortunes are spent. Um, we've also done things where um, the Australian College of Midwives, they have a textbook and they actually listed in their vaccination section, a, a, a link to the AVN's website for people who are studying nursing to go and find more information. Now, one of our members was, I don't know what she was doing on a Saturday night, Joanne Benamou, but she was reading this textbook and she found this link and she got it removed. 
Maybe a small thing, but potentially could be exposed to many, many people. In addition, there are many chiropractors who are anti-vaccine and many of them refer their patients or many of themselves were professional members of the AVN. And constant campaigning by us resulted in the chiropractic board issuing a warning to chiropractors that they were not to use anti-vaccine material and they were not to tell their patients about it anymore. Also, some of you may know that the Healthcare Complaints Commission now has extra powers to investigate um, dodgy kind of health claims. This change in legislation resulted because the AVN took the Healthcare Complaints Commission to the Supreme Court a number of years ago and lost. So there's a lot of things that have happened. So I just wanted to finish with a quote from the ex-president of the AVN. Because although they, tend, they seem to hate science, they, they hate doctors, they hate science, but they, they like it when it suits them. So this is a quote, I think from 2010, where they were talking about how they wanted to do a study comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated children because they insist that unvaccinated children are going to be healthier, have less allergies. In fact, these studies have been done and really the only difference is unvaccinated kids get more vaccine-preventable diseases. That's it. I mean, you know, that's what you'd expect, right? But they were really, really annoyed that we presented this poster. It was like it was their Achilles heel. And it reminded me of this quote from their ex-president some years ago talking about how they tried to publish once in the Medical Journal of Australia. They apparently did a survey of their members and they asked them about whether their kids had more allergies, had more asthma, got sicker more often... But you know what? And they even had a special computer program and a scientist. (laughs) And even though they had a special computer program and a scientist, the Medical Journal of Australia wouldn't publish it. So I I don't know. I, I wonder if this is kind of the special computer program they had. I'm not sure. But I think in light of the fact that, you know, this is the kind of language that resulted in us publishing science through the Public Health Association of Australia. So I think we've really found their Achilles heel in terms of, I mean, they already despise us, but they can't get into the peer-reviewed literature, but we can. So I think in case you weren't listening or if you fell asleep, too long didn't read, their feels are hurt. So I mentioned at the beginning that um, the ex-president talks about how they should that they deserve respect and there should be a respectful discussion between people, even though it's an emotive topic. There is something wrong when people have to rely on name-calling to try and prove their point. Well, I don't know what that was. These are some of the things that she's called doctors um, throughout the course of us monitoring what she says on social media. This one, vaccination is rape with full penetration, was one of the things that she said. And here she says, I'm not the one who does the bullying. Why don't you ask SAVN to treat me with respect? Well, you know what? Here is what I reckon the AVN should do. Publish in the peer-reviewed literature. Go to a conference like we did. Present a poster. And then, like all science, we can argue the facts of vaccination within the pages of peer review. How's that sound? They could close. I say that because I don't think they're ever going to get into the peer-reviewed literature. But you know what? They've spent 20 years doing research, apparently. In 20 years, my degrees only took me eight. How long did yours take, Anne? Probably 20. (laughs) But in any case, they could go to university and they could have got a degree and they can publish like we did. Um, This work was undertaken by volunteers. There's a lot of people that were involved, not just the people that are named... Tracy is the first author. I'm presenting it tonight on her behalf. Anne is also involved. Many other people helped out. We can be found on Facebook. Thank you very much. Our friends at the Canberra Skeptics at canberraskeptics.org.au tell us that they've got some interesting upcoming events. Norden Skold and Shackleton, Early Antarctic Exploration for Science. This is going to be on Thursday, the 21st of August, 6pm to 7.30pm. Where? 
Japan Theatre Questacon. The early history of Antarctic exploration was all in the name of science. But Dr. Paul Willis, oh, he's from the Royal Institution of Australia, has been to the Antarctica eight times. Eight times? What? Why doesn't he invite me? Following in the footsteps of the two early Arctic explorers. One a household name, the other almost completely unknown. In this talk, Dr. Paul Willis will take you to the frozen continent and recreate two epic voyages of scientific discovery. Oh, that sounds like a good talk, folks. If you're in Canberra, I think I can really recommend that talk. Paul Willis, Antarctica, eight times. Hmm. Uh, if you go, ask him about the plesiosaur he found once. Canberra Skeptics also have on the 22nd of August a uh, trivia night. Canberra Skeptics Science Trivia Night at King O'Malley's. That's a, a pub right in the middle of Canberra. For more information, www.canberraskeptics.org.au. This is the Cosmos, a network of a hundred billion galaxies. And it's the greatest story science has ever told. Congratulations to Adrian Morgan, the winner of the Cosmos DVD pack, the Billions and Billions Photograph Competition. You can view Adrian's winning uh, photograph based on the Billions and Billions idea via visiting the Skeptic Zone Facebook page. As Adrian says, his picture is a pair of equations, one horizontal, the other vertical, like a crossword Physical objects stand in for quantities. The first equation reads hundreds by thousands cubed is less than icing sugar. Hmm. If hundreds and thousands, the famous confectionery, are called hundreds and thousands, then icing sugar could be very reasonably called billions and billions. In fact, I calculate that just one milliliter of icing sugar contains more than 10 billion grains. <laughs> Adrian, I'm sure you're right. Congratulations, your cosmos... DVD pack, the complete new series, is on the way. Welcome to a week in science from RA Oz, bringing you the science you need to know. Where did the Earth come from? The Big Bang? Some divine intervention? Or the Rachnos, maybe? Let's go right back to the Big Bang, the start of the universe. After the Big Bang, the universe mostly consisted of two forms of the lightest elements, which are hydrogen and helium. Some of these started clumping together, creating heavier masses, which attracted more and more particles inwards. As they clumped together, they started nuclear fusion, which releases energy and resulted in them forming stars. And right in the centre of these stars where fusion was occurring, heavier elements such as carbon and iron formed. Eventually, some of these stars exploded in a supernova, flinging themselves throughout the universe and restarting this process of star formation and building more and more heavy elements. One of these stars is our Sun. After it formed, the Sun's gravity started collecting rocky debris into a disk called a nebula, with some of it colliding and combining to form larger bodies. With these larger bodies came stronger gravity, collecting more and more pieces together. This process of collecting bits together and combining them into a larger body is called accretion. Radioactive decay and heat from these collisions caused the young Earth to be molten, but after a while the outer surface eventually cooled and became the crust. The molten Earth still exists under the crust today as mantle. So the Big Bang didn't directly create the Earth, but did lead to a process which resulted in its formation. And now, four fast facts about planetary formation. The process of creating the Earth took a really long time. It is thought the Earth has only existed for a third of the time since the Big Bang. During its early life, the Sun created solar winds which pushed gas molecules to the outer regions of the solar system. What was left behind were the rock clumps which went on to form the Earth and other planets. The Moon is thought to be made up of bits of Earth which were broken off during a collision with a large body. These bits eventually clumped together to form a single Moon. 
and I mentioned that the Earth formed out of rock clumps, so water on Earth was most likely introduced by impacts from icy meteorites. That's it for this week in science. For more information on the formation of planets, go to the RAL's website, riaus.org.au. Follow us on Twitter at RIOS and like us on Facebook. I'm Ben Lewis and we'll catch you next week. Want to get in touch with nature without the fallacies? Come along to Camping Skeptically, organised by the Brisbane Skeptic Society. Spend two nights at the Tulbura Chalet in the picturesque Bunya Mountain. Enjoy the company of fellow skeptics with bushwalks, barbecues, and pseudoscience movie night, along with a few drinks. It's only sixty dollars for two nights, September twelfth to the fourteenth. Places are strictly limited, so go to BrisbaneSkeptics.org for more details. This is Joe Alabaster. The following appeared in the Sunshine Coast Daily newspaper, August 13th, 2014, by Kathy Sundstrom. Appalling vaccination rates on the Sunshine Coast have sparked the need for a beaming new immunisation billboard along the Bruce Highway. Sunshine Coast Medicare Local has launched its immunisation billboard campaign, starting in Palmview, as a result of the region having the highest number of conscientious objectors to immunisation in the country. National data on immunisation rates show that there are 660 children in the region with a registered conscientious objection next to their name, bringing the figure to 7.1%, the highest in the country. But this number is less than half of the region's 1,419 children who records show are not fully immunised. Landsborough GP Peter Dobson warned that without herd immunity, more people were at risk of falling ill to largely preventable diseases. Quote, Complacency is set in, end quote, Dr. Dobson said. Quote, people don't see the diseases, so they question why their child should get the needles. But this complacency can lead to a rise in diseases like whooping cough, end quote. Nutritionist and author Cindy O'Meara who lives in Malulaba, doubted the campaign would work. She believes vaccination rates are dropping because, quote, more people are becoming educated about the dangers of vaccines, end quote. Ms. O'Meara has never had a vaccine in her life and hasn't had an antibiotic or a painkiller and neither have her children. Quote, people are beginning to question immunizations and the amount we are having, end quote, she said. Quote, Maybe they're not as safe as we've been told, and they are no longer sure if they should sacrifice their child for the greater good. Social media is telling us the truth now. A mother put up how her daughter went to get her cervical cancer vaccine, and three hours later she is dead. End quote. She said she wasn't against the, quote, philosophy behind vaccines, end quote, but did question, quote, dubious ingredients, end quote. Dr. Dobson stressed the overwhelming research worldwide backed the benefits of vaccines. Quote, You're a thousand times safer from diseases when given vaccines, end quote, he said. Quote, This has been shown over many years and many examples. People don't want to listen to this. They want to throw up one example of a child screaming as a rare side effect to a vaccine. They don't see the numbers of cases, as we did many years ago, of children dying from whooping cough. End quote. After this story was published, of course, many uh, concerned people wrote to the editor of the Sunshine Coast Daily. Heidi Robinson from the Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters Group received this response. Thank you for your letter. As you are no doubt well aware, there are two very distinct points of view on the immunization debate and the daily as a newspaper, tries to present points of view from both sides. While I have received several complaints about the inclusion of Ms. O'Meara's views in the article, I have received at least as many complaints that it was biased towards the pro-immunization camp. All the daily, and the media in general, 
can do is present both sides of the debate as impartially as possible. When we are receiving complaints from both sides, it suggests to me that we are doing a pretty good job of walking the fine line down the middle. As to Ms. O'Meara's, quote, qualifications, end quote, she is a well-known Sunshine Coast nutritionist with a high profile in the area and a strong point of view on immunization. She has never pretended to be any more than that. Regards, Damien Bathersby, Acting Editor, Sunshine Coast Daily. This is Ross Bolt from the Brisbane Skeptic Society. In response to the Sunshine Coast Daily article in which a nutritionist who expressed some anti-vaccine sentiments was featured, I wrote an open letter. Dear Mr. Damien Bathersby, I wanted to discuss some concerns I had about an article that appeared in the Sunshine Coast Daily on August the 13th, Low Vaccination Rates Sparks New Campaign. First, I would like to commend the Sunshine Coast Daily for bringing attention to the important issue of vaccination uptake, as well as the benefits of vaccination. It is crucial for the future health of our children and indeed ourselves that the general population continue to vaccinate. That being said, I have some significant concerns about the content of the article that I feel need to be addressed urgently and should be considered for future articles. I'm sure by now that you are aware of the idea of false balance in the media. The term refers to instances in which the media attempts to present two sides of a particular issue in the name of fairness and balance, where in reality there is no controversy. There is one established position for which there is overwhelming scientific support and a fringe denial element. Many issues covered by the media are subjective and fall on a grey line. Whether or not a new large supermarket should be built in a quiet country town, or whether people receiving government welfare should work for their payments, are issues for which there are obvious pros and cons and need careful discussion. Topics in science, however, are rarely so grey. Science is a discipline based on empirical evidence, a self-correcting process that leads to firm and definitive conclusions over time. These conclusions are reached by the consensus of experts in any given field after careful evaluation of the evidence. Immunisation is a mature field. Vaccines have been a mainstay of public health for over 100 years. The safety of vaccines is well established and is not controversial amongst those that are scientifically literate, not to mention immunologists, virologists and microbiologists. To say the vaccine denial and vaccine danger proponents are a fringe minority is a huge understatement. Proponents of such theories have no scientific evidence on their side. In fact, they are frequently found to distort and sometimes lie about a variety of factors associated with vaccine efficacy and safety. Imagine then my dismay when I read the above-mentioned article to find the quote of Cindy O'Meara. It is questionable whether nutritionists are adequately qualified in their own field compared to, say, a dietitian, a regulated title, let alone even remotely qualified in the area of immunology. As such, the opinions of Ms. O'Meara have absolutely no place in an article about vaccination. She states people are beginning to question immunisations and the amount we are having. It should be noted that the only reason this statement is true is because people such as herself spread misinformation about immunisation, not because of any legitimate concerns by experts in the field of immunology. She continues, maybe they are not as safe as we have been told, and they are no longer sure if they should sacrifice their child for the greater good. Social media is telling us the truth now. She has no expertise in which to speculate about the safety of vaccines. Further, by stating, as we have been told, is implying some kind of conspiracy that frankly just doesn't exist. The word sacrifice is an emotionally loaded term that has absolutely no relevance to what happens during the vaccination programme, in which less than one in a thousand children suffer side effects and even less serious adverse events. To suggest that social media is an appropriate source of medical information is absurd, given the dangerous amount of misinformation propagated by such means. She continues, A mother put up how a daughter went to get her cervical cancer vaccine, and three hours later, she is dead. This statement lacks detail, but is likely a dangerous distortion of an event in which a young girl received the vaccine and was subsequently in a car accident, or perhaps another incident in which the girl who received the vaccine unfortunately died from a tumour. Both are completely unrelated to the vaccination. That this statement was even made in the first place demonstrates the potential dishonesty of Ms. O'Meara. She continues that she said that she wasn't against the philosophy behind vaccines, but did question dubious ingredients. 
This statement is also irresponsible. It is a common tactic by vaccine denialists to use the just asking questions gambit, bringing up points that have been refuted over and over again by qualified immunologists. There are no ingredients in vaccines that have been considered dubious. In fact, a great deal of research has been conducted into each and every ingredient contained within a vaccine for both safety and effect on efficacy. Being vague and not listing a specific ingredient makes it hard for readers to research specifically which ingredients are to be considered dubious. This article has raised serious questions in my mind as as to the process by which journalists at your publication research their articles and the sources quoted in them. Is any attempt made to check into whether sources are appropriately qualified to give an opinion on the topic in question? Are the backgrounds of sources checked for potential bias and motives that may come into play? This isn't the first time in the past month that the standards of science reporting in your publication have been substandard. An article published on the 1st of August titled DNA Computer to Identify Ebola contained a table titled World's Deadliest Diseases. Unfortunately, the table contained two organisms that were not viruses. Although this oversight may seem small, as an interface between science and the public, publications such as yours have a duty to ensure accurate information is presented to help prevent the propagation of misinformation. When this misinformation takes the form of important public health in- initiatives, a la Ms. O'Meara's comments, diligence is even more important. I look forward to your response on this matter. Regards, Ross Bolch, President, Brisbane Skeptic Society. Although I have yet to receive a response to this letter, the letter was published as the letter of the day in the Sunshine Coast Daily. Hey, this is Jay Novella from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. Did you know that there are thousands of skeptical reports, interviews, and investigations going back to 1981 free to download? Just visit www.skeptics.com.au. Click the publications link and enjoy almost every back issue of The Skeptic, the journal from Australian skeptics. You can also subscribe online and get the latest digital or hard copy of this, the world's second oldest skeptical magazine. That's www.skeptics.com.au or just Google Australian skeptics. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. I'm still here perched up in the control area. There's a couple of cars still out there on the track doing some hot laps and things like that. And uh, it's a great day for the, for the racing enthusiast and the racing enthusiast who likes to drive cars. Well, what more could you want? Get to drive a car around a racetrack. In the, uh, in the howling wind, here comes car six back from the pits. Just coming into the uh, pit lane right now. Well, I'm looking forward in the coming weeks to doing some Mystery Investigators programs uh, shows once again with my good friend Ian Bryce from Australian Skeptics. And also Maynard's going to be uh, chipping in and coming along and being one of the Mystery Investigators soon at uh, the Powerhouse Museum. There's some uh, shows lined up. And for those of you who don't know, the Mystery Investigators is a um, it's a performance. It's we explain science. It's more or less aimed at students, but anybody can enjoy it. We have a bed of nails and we explain how the power balance bracelets seem to work. We bend some spoons, um, talk about fire walking, all sorts of interesting and fun things. Looking forward to that. But for this week, from the windswept Calder Park Raceway, just outside of Melbourne in Victoria, this is Richard Saunders signing off. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports.